So, part of our bumper morning, we've got you know, just two fantastic talks, and then I'm delighted to introduce our second speaker, who is Christopher Long, who is the Martin uh, Kermesey Centennial Professor of Architecture and Design History at the University of Texas at Austin. Now, Christopher has published widely on various aspects of Central European and American modernism, um, which is deeply relevant to the context of the, the subject this semester. Christopher studied at the University of Graz, Munich, and Vienna, received his doctoral degree at the University of Texas at Austin in 1993, and he first taught at the Central European University in Prague before returning to, to Austin, trained as a cultural historian. Christopher's scholarly approach draws from cultural and intellectual history, as well as social history and cultural anthropology, and his dissertation was a study of the Viennese architect and designer Joseph Frank, which is deeply relevant. Um, to what we are studying this semester. Since that time, he has written extensively on various aspects of Central European modernism, and he's also published monographs in several notable Central European and the architects and designers in the United States. Among his many books are The New Space Movement Experience in Viennese Modern Architecture, um, in New Haven in London, in Yale University Press in two, uh, 2016, Out of, Out of Loose on Trial 2017, Essays on Arrow Flus um, 2019 um, and Arrow Flus The Late Houses from 2020. Also, Jock Peters Architecture and Design the Varieties of Modernism um, from 2021. Now, his book, The New Space um, Movement and Experience in Viennese Modern Architecture, published by Yale University Press in 2016, really is a groundbreaking volume that reveals how three Viennese architects, Joseph Frank, Arrow Flus, and Oscar Sklenad, grappled with and ultimately transformed the modern concept of space in the early 20th century. And this um, was ultimately the book that led me to invite Christopher to talk to critical and curatorial practice this year. So thank you, Christopher, um, for joining us. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm delighted to be uh, with you this morning. Uh, I wish I could be there with you in Melbourne. Alas, that's not possible. Um, but uh, I hope I can illuminate some of your discussions, as I understand it, uh, about The Endless House and Frederick Kiesler. Uh, what I want to explore with you to this morning is, or, or, or more to the point, are the ways in which the Viennese predecessors of Kiesler, na namely Otto Floss and Josef Frank, but also, as I'll briefly uh, discuss, also the work of Oskar Strunet, laid the basis for Kiesler's notion of the endless house. But I want to start somewhere else in Central Europe. I actually want to start in Brno, in a house that I'm sure that is familiar to all of you, uh, the Tugendhat house. And you can see the view of the Tugendhat house from the door where one enters um, into the main living space, looking out through those fabulous windows and overlooking the city of Brno. This is one form of the endless house, the endless space, for the space continues here both visually through the container and to the outside and across the city and presumably uh, as, as far as one can see. Um, but the, the endlessness of the house is also um, created by the fact that the windows can be lowered entirely. And I've seen this in, in effect. Uh, a close friend of mine was the director of the house for many years. Uh, and she showed me one day that there's a motor in the basement and you can press a button and very much like an automobile window, you can lower all of those windows so that the house is completely open. It's an extraordinary thing to see. Uh, it is absolutely not to US code and I suspect not to Australian building codes because it's about a three meter drop off that one side. Uh, definitely a child killer when the windows are down, uh, but really quite extraordinary in the sense that the space continues through the container and beyond. But of course, space, space here is delimited. Space is delimited by the ceiling and the floor. What we're really dealing with in some measure is the, the horizontal space of an architectural sandwich of sorts. And the space here is also in large measure visual, um, much more than it is in, in a sense fully experiential. Where I wanna begin is with uh, something that I talked about in the new space, uh, and that's the writings of August Schmosso. Schmosow was a uh, German theorist art historian at uh, the University of Leipzig, 
um, when he was appointed as a professor there in the 1890s, early 1890s, he gave quite an extraordinary address in which he announced, rather to the astonishment, I suspect, of all of those in the audience, that architecture simply wasn't about building or mass or style. It was fundamentally about space, that architecture was space. And more to the point that architecture was about the manipulation of architectural space, that it was the way in which space was created that was really what architecture fundamentally was. And even more, Shimonoso continued in, in some later essays, including um, one that appeared not too long after he published his inaugural address, um, that architectural space was fundamentally about the way in which we experience it. This was an echo of a number of debates that were going on in Germany at the time. I don't have time here to uh, go into that. You can read about that. It's the first part of the new space. Um, it had very much to do with how we see space, how we experience space through our bodies, uh, how we experience space haptically, for example, but also through our ears and through our other senses. Um, and the upshot of all of that was that Shmozov laid out a path towards a new way of making space. That space could be the best space in, in any architectural construct was the space that one could experience most fully and completely. Most people at the time, most certainly most architects at the time didn't read Schmasso. And if they had, I don't think they would have understood what he was talking about. But there was one architect in Vienna uh, who was a true intellectual. Os his, his name's Oskar Strunad, S-T-R-N-A-D. Strunad uh, read Shmosov and he took uh, Shmosov at his word that one could create an architectural construct that was fully about experience. And Strunad experimented with that in a series of houses that he built just before World War I, most notably this house, the Wassermann House, which was built out on the outskirts of Vienna. Now in, it's a very nice leafy suburb in those days. It was out on the very edge of the city. It is stylistically not particularly interesting. It's Biedermeyer Revival, which was what was popular uh, in Vienna in the period. But if you look at the building carefully, you'll notice something rather interesting, and that is that the fenestration is odd, uh, deeply odd. In fact, nothing quite seems to line up. It's difficult even from, um, from this relatively simple container to make it how many levels we're looking at. And if you look at the house in plan, there's also something else notable, and that is that Strunet draw drew into the plan a diagonal line, or actually a couple of diagonal lines, showing how one moved through the space. Then one looped through this L-shaped dining room and living room in the back. And more notably, interestingly, that in the staircase in the middle of the container, can you see my arrow? Yeah. Yeah, that as you go up the stairs, you'll notice that you twist and turn as you go up. In other words, that you're forced to change directions as you climb the stair. I'll come back to why that's relevant in a bit. So there's the L-shaped living room. It's pretty standard Viennese construction for the time. Concrete uh, um, beams, um, uh, block walls with uh, stucco or render uh, on the outside and brick and otherwise not particularly interesting. The furniture pretty typical for the period in Vienna. You can see this is the Wassermann family. Uh, Jakob Wassermann was a fairly well-known German writer of the time. But what's notable for our story here is the way in which one roots or is rooted through the house, better put. And you can see the son of the family here standing on the stair. And you'll notice something very interesting, which is the stair goes first to the left, and then it turns immediately to the right. You can follow the, the, the uh, banister and then up again and up again around. And you'll notice at the very top that there's a cutout so that you can see through. And you'll notice that again, the stair roots back the other way. Why? Why in a relatively small building, this is a two-story house ostensibly, why make such a complex stairway? And the answer is that Strunet took Schmozo as word and said, if architecture is about experience, then the most radical experience, the most complete, the most full experience, in this case, bodily experience, corporeal experience, would be the best architecture. Going up and feeling one's body as one makes these very abrupt turns, and seeing the light change and flicker and, and come and go as one sees past that wall up into the window and so forth would create the greatest possible spatial experience. 
And the same thing plays out on the outside. After one goes to the living room, one comes through the French doors out onto a lovely terrace. There's a staircase there. And now you can see again the Wasserman family sitting on the staircase. And you notice once again that the windows are very curious. You go up those stairs, there's a door there, there's a window at one level, but suddenly just to the right and above is another window at a slightly different level. So what's the floor level where it too is altered here? In other words, there are multiple levels in the single container in the single volume. Space here has become, in other words, fully three-dimensional. This is probably the most important contribution that the Viennese would make uh, in this period right around World War I was to take the Shmosov idea and to make it not only experiential, but to posit a new kind of spatial experience, a spatial experience that had to do not only with walking and climbing and turning, but a spatial experience that had to do with creating rooms on different levels with markedly different ceiling heights. The architect par excellence of all of this, of course, the one that who's known for doing this is Adolf Loos. And you see here a, a photograph of Adolf Loos's Goldman and Salach building, so the Loos house in uh, central Vienna, just across from the Imperial Palace. It was a combination um, tailor shop. That was the main purpose of the building. That's who Goldman and Salach were. There were noted tailors in the city. There are shops along the ground floor on either side. Above in five floors were apartments, rather expensive apartments. And up at the mansard roof was a school for the tailor shop. At first glance, the building seems relatively unremarkable, although quite plain for the time. And it's best known, of course, for the controversy it evoked because of the lack of ornament. But what's much more interesting for me ultimately is what it's doing spatially. And that sense of space, the, the, the complexity of the space is not actually clearly given in the plans that were published at the time. The upper plan here shows the uh, apartment levels. They were pretty much identical through the five floors. They're very standard arrangement of apartments. The rooms being arranged en filade, very, very simple, very straightforward. The ground floor, you can say this is the main part of the tailor shop here. And these other spaces were all rental spaces for uh, other retail establishments. But it's only when one looks at the facade and examines it carefully that the true complexity of the building becomes apparent. For in this view, you can see that the building is certainly not a standard set of equal layers, equal floors. Um, in fact, it's difficult to make out here unless you have a very good understanding of the interior, precisely how many floors you're looking at. And it's more than the three or four that you think that you're seeing here. So relatively standard plan, so it would seem. And certainly the first plan that Lois drew also suggests the same. Indeed, you can see also that the relatively straightforward construction here, it's a modern building in the sense that it's a frame building. That frame, of course, is important because it allows him to move up the floors from one from the other by simply uh, uh, repositioning the lintels in different places. And you can see that if you see a construction photo of the building, it's really fa fairly remarkable. In fact, that very broad entrance where the, th the four columns are um, was in fact a concrete lintel. And not just any concrete little bit lintel, but a concrete lintel that was actually suspended from an enormous frame. So in fact, you're looking at a big frame above, the, this this uh, entry is actually suspended through rebar from the top down, really quite remarkable. A uh, pretty extraordinary piece of modern construction. But even more remarkable on the inside, because when one enters, it's a full double height space. The lower part of the building was for finished articles for uh, the gentleman who would frequent the store. And this was a very expensive store. So you have a uh, outdoor wear, underwear, socks, handkerchiefs, and so forth. And upstairs was where the gentleman would be fitted for custom suits and other clothing. You can see the staircase leading up, that awful green carpet's not original, that was placed there by the bank that now owns the building to protect the stairs. Uh, but you get a very good sense of something else here, and that is that not only is the staircase itself not unlike Stunitz's experiential staircase, rather complex in its form, but you'll notice the use of mirrors and also lux for prisms in the roof to create very interesting lighting effects. 
It's almost like a fun house when one enters into this space as one walks along. It's very difficult to make out where one is going. It's equally difficult to make out how the spaces are being arranged. It's really quite an extraordinary experience to ascend that staircase. When one reaches the first landing, there is a kind of cubicle. That's where the accountants were. And then several more staircases leading in all kinds of directions. Each of them has a function for this upper floor was divided according to places where the clients would be served and how they would be served. So service and served spaces. There was a lowered ceiling space, very much almost like a London club uh, where the gentleman would sit and wait. Why the lowered ceiling here? To create a sense of intimacy. So Los was also very, very keen about how experience could be used to create a sense of mood. The same is true of the office next door where the gentleman would meet with the master tailors to describe what they wanted. So one would sit in a relatively small space with a lowered ceiling. But there were other spaces, for example, this area where the gentleman would select the fabrics that they wanted that was um, double height with a cut through or single height and then with a cut through down to the next floor. And you'll notice the use again of the windows of light here and uh, this sense of drama that's created through uh, cutting through the floor. There were also practical reasons for doing this for on the other side of the, this uh, building, the tailors would work upstairs and you can see the, the journeyman tailors here cutting uh, and the partially finished suits, and then they would be lowered down to the apprentices and others who were working down below and then brought back up. And then there was another sort of conveyance that would take these up to where the gentleman would actually be fitted. Interestingly, the lowest space in the building was where women worked. Uh, the women made shirts, uh, and it was uh, um, uh, women who were perceived only to have hands small enough to do the very, very fine work to make men's shirts. And you notice that they work in a very low ceiling space, deliberately made low because of course they're sitting, but more importantly, because the space had to be very, very warm. In a time before global warming, this space had to be extremely warm for your fingers. You wouldn't be able to work your fingers well if they were cold. You can notice along the left-hand side here, an enormous radiator to keep the room almost like a sauna so that you would be as limber as possible to work in the space. So each space was also functionally high or low, so to speak. And it was also about experience. Lois would take this idea over the next 20 years and develop it into what he would call, or actually more importantly, his assistant, a man named Hannes Kulke, would call the round plan, the space plan. Kulke seems to have coined the term. He seems to have coined the term in the early 1930s. Um, he wrote the only extended essay about the round plan during Lois's life, based purportedly on interviews and discussions that he had with Lois. The most important of the round plan houses, or one of the most important of the round plan houses you see here, and that's the Mola House in Vienna. You see it as it was originally. It's impossible, by the way, nowadays to take a photograph of this house because it's these real ambassador's house in Vienna, and they prohibit you from taking photographs. Um, but my photographer and I, when we worked on the new space, got permission to photograph the inside of the building and a few places on the outside um, after being thoroughly checked out by the Mossad. And you can see, again, in the historic photograph, how very different the front and back facades are, very typical of Los. He creates a front facade that's almost enigmatic, very strange, almost anthropomorphic. The rear facade is much more standard, almost normal for modern architecture, also open and engaging, uh, certainly uh, engaging the garden but in the back. But it's the entry sequence that should interest us here. So as one goes in that central front portal, and I'll go back one second and show you, we, one enters just here underneath that extended oriel. And as you walk in, you walk into a very small vestibule that's not much wider than the door swing, and you come directly to a wall. Very odd to enter a grand villa and walk directly into a wall. We couldn't quite photograph that because of security purposes. 
But in that vestibule, it forces you to turn either left or right. If you turn left, you go immediately to a door for unclear purposes. It's actually the service entrance into the house. If you turn right, you see the staircase here. You extend up those stairs. You're forced again to turn very abruptly again to the left and again up the stairs. And then you're forced to turn very abruptly once more. Again, this is the Smorsovian idea of creating architectural experience. You come to a landing here, and then again, you ascend into the main spaces of the house. And you'll notice once more, very much as Strunet had done, he cuts through the walls here in several different places. This creates what I call a punctuated sense of space, for as you move along, the views open and close. So in each place, depending on where you're standing, either your view continues, or it's partially blocked, or then it's fully blocked as you move from space to space to space. The space is so complex, actually, that Los had one of his assistants, again, this is Mr. Kulka, draw it out so they could probably, so they could count the stairs, but also so they could work out the construction. And you can see what happens here. You, you come up that uh, staircase from the side, you enter into the main body of the house. Uh, that main body of the house is actually on three different levels. There's a seating area, there's an upper uh, 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 podium, and then there are two other adjoining rooms on this side which are not shown. That's the music room and the dining room. So you see here, this is the, the lower seating space and the upper seating space, not the original colors. That's Israeli flag blue. Very appropriate given its function nowadays, but not gives you a rather false impression. The staircase beyond goes into the upstairs where the bedrooms are. The staircase here in the foreground goes up into the gentleman's room, uh, the gentleman's study on the one side, and the lady's boudoir here, which is a, an open space. Immediately opposite to it is the music room below from which this image was taken and looking up into the dining room. Originally, the stair was not configured this way. It was a much narrower stair um, with uh, a drop off on either side, again, not to code. And this was to separate the two spaces more fully, but eventually they took that out because it was so impractical. But the very interesting thing about this space is that, uh, that it can be entirely reconfigured. By closing the sliding doors or the other doors, you can create the double space, the dining room and music room or living room together. You can open it into the boudoir and then see the stair going up to the study. You can also see then see also the stair going up to the uh, upper bedrooms, or you can make any sort of combination of these spaces. In other words, the space could be remade at will in any kind of configuration. Most takes this idea and takes it to an extreme, an even greater extreme, in the Müller House in Prague. Uh, the, Mr. Müller, Frontership Müller was his name, was a well-known builder uh, in Prague, and he hired Los uh, to build his single-family house on one of the highest hills uh, in Vienna. I'm sorry, in, in Prague. Did I say Vienna before I meant Prague? Uh, in Prague. Uh, you see here what is ostensibly the front of the house, but you'll also notice that there's no entrance, in fact, because the house is entered from the rear. So you come up actually from the streetcar, even, even today, from the side of the house, uh, unless you drive up, and you come around and you actually enter the house from the back. Uh, it's a very odd arrangement, again, of windows telling you that there is a round plan fully in play here. You can see the entry sequence coming down the driveway. You go past a, a uh, seating area and then into the main uh, part of the house, very narrow doorway. And then you follow a course through the house to the upstairs. If you look at the plans of the house, quite aside from the fact that in, in this case, of course, they're in check. So we're looking at the basement on the left and the first floor on the right. Um, they read more or less as conventional spaces. In fact, they read as very conventional spaces for a modern house in the sense that there's very little free-flowing open space. This is not the Tugendhat house with its open, continuous volumes. Space here continues in a very different sort of way, not along the horizontal, but through the vertical. That's hard even to discern in plan. Uh, I'm sorry, in section. Um, and so even through the sections, it's very hard to read these houses. I have to say that until I was uh, first in the Moller house, I never really fully understood how it worked. 
um, because the photographs don't simply uh, supply enough information to put together what the spatial experience is like. So I'm going to walk you through the sequence. This house has now been fully restored, very, very carefully, all the way back to all of its original colors. So we've grown accustomed to seeing modern architecture in black and white photos. We forget, in fact, that many of these houses were indeed quite colorful, including a red radiator, uh, green walls, and then you enter into a cloak room that had uh, a yellow curtain and a blue ceiling. That's just here. Really extraordinary colors. We really forget this about modern architecture that, of this time, that it was really quite extraordinarily colorful. Again, the red radiators. Past this sort of eddy in the circulation route, one continues up a staircase and into the main space. And just as you come up, this is the last view you get before you enter into the main living room area. And you can see once again, very much like Stone before him, that Los creates this sense of mystery. It's very difficult to discern where one is going, what one's going to see, what one's going to experience. There's a very keen uh, bodily experience. There's a haptic experience because of touching either the walls or, or cold marble or the banisters and so forth, or the, the, um, the sides of the, the, uh, the walls. Otherwise, one enters up into the living room. Again, this has been fully restored, very close to the way it was originally with this uh, beautiful marble framing the house, basically bifurcating the house in a kind of line. And here now you get a, a full sense of the conceit. So you enter into the living room. To the left is a series of windows that go out onto a terrace. They're French doors. That terrace extends across the front of the house and has an extraordinary view of uh, Prague because you're quite high here. You're about 300 meters above the city of Prague looking back down. You see the living room here, what were often described as windows before anyone was able to get into this house, because for a long time it was actually inaccessible. It was perceived to have been windows, but these were indeed fish tanks, actually, that Los had installed for the client. And now you can see the continuation of one of the staircases, which comes here and goes up to the center of the house and eventually leads up to, into the main um, uh, two floors with the bedrooms. If you continue the the route this way, you come into the dining room area. So again, the fish tanks looking back, the dining room above. And here are the staircase, and you can see that the staircase splits. So as you come up from downstairs, just here, you have three choices. You can walk into the living room, you can, can continue to your left, and that leads into the ladies' boudoir and the gentleman's study back behind it, which is on yet another level, or up into the dining room. Or if you come up to this le level, then you can continue on the staircase that leads up to the upper two floors, upper two main floors. <coughs> Here it is again, this is the dining room. Very typically for Los with the ceiling lowered to create a sense of intimacy. And in this case, he has a wooden ceiling with a highly polished surface that acts effectively like a musical instrument. In other words, it allows the voice to vibrate and you can speak at a very, very low tone, almost a hush tone here, and be heard anywhere in the dining room, indeed out into the living room. It's really quite remarkable how the acoustics work here. Notice from this space that you can see across to the boudoir, so the ladies' boudoir here, and then you can follow the route of the staircase up. So once again, your eye takes you places in just the way that your body does as well if you move along these routes. If you continue across that central route, you come up through this um, staircase that winds through the entire volume of the upper part of the house. There's a skylight above that illuminates it. It leads to the rooms. The rooms are on the upper floors arranged more or less conventionally on normal uh, levels. And indeed, they are fairly traditional rooms. They are not indeed particularly modern rooms. This is the bedroom, for example, uh, the main bedroom of the house. Los's round plan idea, which involved repeated twists and turns in very, very short distances, very much as Schmidt had done, was something that Josef Frank, who is the third of our architects uh, uh, that I want to talk about with you uh, this morning, um, took and modified. Frank was very interested, as Schmidt was, in fact, they had been partners before World War I, in this idea of the house as an experiential um, 
uh, construct. Uh, what Franck does within that notion, though, is to relax the stroll, to relax that walk. Instead of this constant twisting and turning, turning left and right, what Franck does is to create a kind of saunter through the house. And he does this most impressively in a house designed and built between 1928 and 1930 called the Villa Bear, spelled B-E-R, uh, but pronounced bear like the big furry thing. Uh, you can see it here. It uh, was recently purchased uh, by a wealthy Viennese entrepreneur. Uh, it is not always open to the public, but now frequently for a very long time, it was closed to the public. Uh, so if you find yourself in Vienna, you can get in. The Villa Müller um, um, in Prague is a museum. You just have to, to uh, make reservations to see it. The Villa Müller is completely closed and very, very difficult to get into. Um, but this is another house you can see and experience. Very much like the Losian houses, it too is a kind of mystery when it looks at the facade. How many layers are there? I always ask my students this. Well, how many, how many levels are there in this house? And conventionally, you might count one, two, three, four, and that's probably almost right, excluding a basement, except that they're really more like six or seven because of the way in which the platforms works work as one moves up and through the house. What's also very odd about this house is that what appears to be the main entrance of the house here is actually the service entrance. The main entrance is again under this extending front bay or, or um, uh, uh, block that's supported by two um, piloti. So you, this is quite recessed and you enter here. Uh, from this gate on this side, it would be obvious to anyone who came at the time because that's the one with the mailbox. And you can see now the arrangement. You come into the front, you enter into that central space, the service entrance is on the side. Again, you can see the complexity of the fenestration and the difficulty actually of discerning what it is that the house is actually going to do once one enters. If you read the house from the side, it reads as a kind of thin slab of basically three and a half or four stories tall with projecting bays extending out from either side. So in fact, it looks as if you've pulled out dresser drawers from a rather thin volume. In plan, once again, if you look at one of the conventional plans in this case of the, uh, of the upstairs is the living spaces, they read pretty much as uh, a not particularly ambitious modern house. But there's a trick here, and it's a trick that Los uses in his drawings as well. And that is that there's, there's a single clue here, a single set of clues that tell us that we're not looking at a conventional plan. And those clues have to do with the numbers that are in the circles. Those numbers, of course, refer to the height of the space. So three, 340 in one case, 555 and the other telling us how many meters it is above ground level. That's the first clue we have to the real complexity of the house. Even in section, it's difficult to discern to some extent what's going on here. Yes, it's clear that there's a double height space on, on the one side, on the rear side. There's an entresol or in German Zwischengeschoss or Zwischenstock in between. You can see it there, uh, but that doesn't tell us the whole story. So again, I will walk you through the spaces. If you look at look at the house in a cutaway, it starts to make a bit more sense, but not entirely. So here it is. One enters the house from the front into a cloakroom. It's an actually extended cloakroom, uh, L-shaped. Then you come into the main space. And this is the first view you have as you come into the main part of the house. You notice here very interestingly that the door is on the right, which is to say that it swings the opposite direction that it should. Normally we teach students that you swing the door away from a, or toward a wall, not away from a wall like that. Uh, but here the door opens along that wall until it's completely open to the open space on the one side. Why did Franck do this? So they enter the room slowly so that your view is very, very slowly created as you come into this space. Once you enter the space, and of course this is how the house looked originally, and close the door behind you, you can begin to discern 
partly the complexity of the house, but also the extraordinary nature of the spaces. So you enter into this uh, space that Frank called the Halle or the hall of the um, building. There's an ingle nook and a small fireplace to one side, an area typically in Viennese houses where you would have entertained um, people who were not close friends. Um, even sort of, you know, people there for business, for example, if they were only staying for a short time. Then you'll notice that there's a staircase to one side. It leads up half height, about a meter and a half to one space. Then it continues up beyond. It comes up to this entresol or Zwischenstock above. You can see there's a big piano there. And then you'll notice that the stair continues. And once again, it's cut out so that you can see up through the house. This is the arrangement as the house is now. It's been partially restored. The furniture has not been restored, but the house has been partially restored. Uh, at one point, this house was actually cut into two units. So there was a wall actually built onto this landing to divide the two houses, the two spaces. But you can get some sense now of how it works. So here's the Halle below, the ingle nook back to the one side. This is the main living room just beyond. That's the music room above, which we'll come to in a bit. And if you turn 180 degrees around from this view, you will come into um, the dining room. So again, to step back into the Halle, you can see now back to where the Inglenook originally was. That bench has been, of course, removed. You can see the music room above. The door here that leads back to the service stair, this block below is the kitchen and other service spaces. Um, and above, when you come at this landing, if you turn to this side, you come into the library, which we'll see in another minute. So there's the double height dining room. Just off the hall, you're looking back again to the living room here and up to the entresol, up to the music room. The whole house was designed because the bears who were um, in the business of making rubber soles for shoes um, were opera fans. And they had many, many friends in the opera, including well-known opera singers who would come to the house and sing and entertain. And the whole idea was that you could stand up on that balcony in the so-called music space here and be heard throughout the house. You could be heard through the hall and into the living room and back into the dining room. And that big person door for piano up there is a big solid thing and it'll play actually loud enough to be heard everywhere in the downstairs spaces. Notice how here also very cleverly with Frank, the division between service and serve spaces. So just behind that door is the, is the pantry and the kitchen. If you come the other way, so you're looking now back into the dining room on this side. Oops, I'm sorry. Back to the dining room on that side. That's the music room. This is the bedroom level above. And now you're at the level of the uh, living room here, looking over back down towards the ingle nook. And it's there that you enter into the living room. You can see it as it originally was. That's the library above. So it too is open and looks down. This is the back of the house. The rear of the house looks out into the garden. You'll notice here also, those of you who don't know anything about Josef Frank, he later on, not very long after this house was finished in 1934, moved to Sweden and became one of the progenitors of Swedish modern design. You can see it reflected here very, very clearly. This could easily be an Ikea piece. Uh, save the, the 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 small tool that you would ratchet all together but in fact very very similar to what would what would be taken over by Ingvar Kamprad many years later in the 1960s and turned into Ikea this is another view of the living room looking back you can also see Frank's penchant for colors and patterns and so forth that was all part of the experience Frank thought that the more complex a pattern was the more relaxing it was in his view so the whole house was about sort of relaxing and getting away from the work in the world that's the idea of layering for example these different patterns and he often used many patterns in a single room with it for example an oriental carpet this is the room as it is now you can see the library up to the upper right looking across to that built-in piece that i described as an ikea cabinet it's not so far from it looking across now into the music room and then the stairway and so forth above. The whole idea here is Shmozov's idea of that expanded, endless, continuous space 
where you connect with it not only visually but through through bodily movement through your the experience of all of your senses for you can hear across the space particularly in this building because of the music room you can see across it you can feel the surfaces and so forth and Franco's indeed very attentive to the touch of things um, he didn't particularly like for example um, to use metals because uh, he thought they felt cold so he tended to use wood for his chairs and for his balusters where he could So you can see here the, the railing continuing up, in this case, violating a little bit of what I said before, this is actually metal. And you can see how it winds up in this kind of lyrical and beautiful way into the upper floor. You can also see the way in which he cuts windows through the volume to create plays of light everywhere. Everywhere you walk to places that are either lighter or darker, very, very deliberately all arranged in such a way that to maximize the experience of the space. And here you can see now, what the house is like from the entresol looking back down into the hollow to that large window that extends back out into the rear garden. If you turn 180 degrees around from that view, in other words, this is what you would have seen in the 1930s. So the big Brusendorfer piano, it's still there. It's impossible to move the thing out. You're looking back at an Oculus, of course, uh, window. That's the so-called tea room of the house in the rear. So you would sit here and have tea. Uh, it looks as if there's a crack in the window, but that's actually a branch uh, of a tree that was once there. It's no longer there. Um, but it gives you the sense of how Franck used spaces. Spaces sometimes are continuous and interconnected, and sometimes they're very deliberately um, set in opposition or set apart from each other. The tea room, again, creating the sense of intimacy and warmth, but also creating that sense of leisure that was so important for Franck. Los was very much about creating intimacies, but not necessarily about creating this kind of ease and leisure and warmth. Uh, the German word is Gemütlichkeit, that, that sense of, of, of you know, um, hominess or homeliness uh, in a space. Notice also very interestingly in the rear of this space that that idea of the round plan, that idea of a building or a volume on multiple levels continues to the garden. So that the multiple levels actually continue outside the volume. You cannot, in this case, readily open up the building as uh, Mies did in Brno. Um, even in Brno, it was a rather impractical idea to open the windows that way, because at least before global warming, it was much too cold most of the year to do that. Frong makes a sort of it makes his peace with the Viennese climate, as at least as it used to be. Uh, before it got very warm in the winters, and has a has a building that's more or less separates the inside and the outside, um, but very, very deliberately drawn in such a way so that you can continue that path of climbing, ascending, of being in different kinds of spatial situations from place to place to place, even on the outside. And here the house is now as it's uh, in its current state, or almost in its current state. It's been slightly altered even since this uh, image was taken. Frank wasn't entirely happy, ultimately, with the Villa Bear. And in 1930, he published an article uh, describing the concept for the Villa Bear, but also laying out the idea for another kind of spatial arrangement. It had to do with a commission that he had for a client in Los Angeles. We don't know the client's name. Uh, we only have the initials. It was MS, and unclear who that client was, or even if the client really existed. Although Frank had traveled to the United States a few years before, so it's entirely possible he really did have a client. This is one of the um, uh, versions of three that Los created for the so-called House for MS in Los Angeles. And you can see what he does here is to take the horizontal layer and simply rearrange it in complex ways. It's almost as if he's playing now with um, complex but still orthogonal space and shifting them in relation to each other. In other words, he's shifting the thresholds in relation to each other to create the most complex possible space. The house is, is if you read it carefully, bifurcated. You can see a stair here. So it's on the hillside. The back part of the house or the rear part of the house is a little higher than the front part of the house. It must be about a meter and a half, judging by the number of stairs here. So that's version one of the versions of the house for MS. 
This is the second one, which plays the same kind of game. And you can see, oddly enough, he drew a, a section here on the side. And you can see, again, how it plays out with that split between front and back. Again, he uses that conceit of using the little numbers. In this case, this would be three quarters of a meter higher than the front space, which is at zero, and then 180, so 1 1.8 meters and so forth to the back. Uh, and you can see how that plays out. But Frank, again, was not entirely happy with this idea of spatial play. For what it does next is really even more radical and even more exciting. He starts to break with orthogonal space altogether. So in the third version of the house for MS, he begins to create spaces, very few of which are orthogonal at all. He introduces into that space this serpentine patio with a pool. If you read it carefully, you'll notice that it's glazed along most, much of its surface. So you can see into that patio from many places. Though again, there are walls, so you have that sort of punctuated view. As you come into the house, so you would enter under the porch, into a vestibule, into a hall. That's where the, some of the supports are. In this case, the supports themselves are no longer in a regular grid. You would come into the dining room, and the dining room has a wall that slides open and closed. So it can either be very intimate or opened into the tea room. Then there's a sliding panel here that separates that from the music room. In the same way, there's another sliding panel to open or close the living room. In other words, he's creating variable geometry throughout the entire space, very similar to what I was describing that Los had done in the Villa Mola in Vienna, creating these spaces that can be converted to different sorts of things. Franck ultimately was unsatisfied even with this kind of radical new space making. And in the 1950s and 1960s, while he was living in Sweden, so he left Vienna pretty much all together in 1934 and then made the final transition in 1938, he'd been going back and forth. Uh, between Vienna and Stockholm to work in Vienna from time to time, um, he began to think about the possibilities of fully non-orthogonal space. And in a series of houses that he did in the late 1940s, 1947 and beyond, he posited the possibility of creating endless space that was fully and completely non-orthogonal. It's here that we come closest, obviously, to what Kiesler was doing in the endless house, of creating these volumes that are bounded by curving forms, not quite as radically as Kiesler does, because Kiesler's creating a sort of egg-shaped forms, uh, but something pretty similar, spaces that open and close, spaces that can join, but also spaces that can be delimited uh, in such a way that you experience the space in the most complex way possible. Frank writes about this in really rather interesting ways and talks about how when you enter into a regular orthogonal space, you almost immediately apprehend, even if you can't see all four walls, if you, if you in your minds, I know that it's an orthogonal space, you will work out where the other walls are. So in other words, all you need is two walls, the, the long and the short wall, and you'll know the, what the other long and short wall look like. But if you come into a fully non-orthogonal space, what was required is that you actually apprehend the entire surface of the wall to take in how, how the space is configured. And this is exactly um, Frank's notion of how you can be uh, in, engaged, fully aroused by the architectural experience, fully part of what it is to be in a space, as opposed to simply um, seeing it quickly apprehending it and moving on. In other words, most of the time we don't really see space very much at all because we take in what it is very quickly and we move on. With a house like this or some of the other houses that Frank worked on later on, um, and I'd forgotten to put one more in, but he, he typically does this now uh, for, the, for the next 15 years of his life until he dies in 1967. He keeps playing with the possibility of, not, of even more radical non-orthogonality. The problem, of course, is that none of these houses were, were built because uh, it was impossible to build them. Um, not only impossible to build them because the drawings are too, far too rudimentary, really, to to, uh, to create the houses based on what Franck gives us, but they're simply not cost-effective in any sort of meaningful way. Nonetheless, what Franck has here is the full realization Schmoss's idea of the house's experiences, the volume of experiences, the building as something that's fully and completely experiential. 
I'm sure your discussions will bring you very close to this, but you'll begin to understand with Keesler that he's doing something very, very similar with the endless house idea. And if you've not only ex already explored, I haven't seen your syllabi for the course, but if you spend some time looking at the Dome of the Rock from Keesler, you'll find out that the Dome of the Rock is arrayed very, very much like these houses in the sense that it's about a promenade, about walking from one space to the next and experiencing certain very specific things. And I will tell you, if you look at the Dome of the Rock very carefully, not just from the inside, but also from the outside, you'll see the full extent of this promenade. Now, that leads me to one further point, and then I'll, I'll, I'll entertain some questions. And that is, uh, an obvious question is, to what extent is this similar or different from Corbusier, the idea of the promenade, for example, Live le Savoie? And the answer is, it's similar, but not that similar. It's similar in the sense that it engages you, it engages the architecture, and so forth. Corbusier, though, is ultimately interested in something else. He's interested in the way in which spaces are framed. He's interested in views, certainly, but he's always framing the views in a very deliberate way. Um, the experience of movement is simply not, surprisingly, if you go to the different houses, the, the Corbusier houses of that period, and the ones of the Central Europeans, oddly not as dynamic. Uh, there's something really extraordinary going on in the volumes of these houses. And I'll, I'll leave it there and entertain uh, any questions you may have. Thank you, Christopher. Um, now, Christopher, we might want to jump back into your PowerPoint. I'm not sure, depending on the questions, but maybe if you stop sharing, that means you're, you're full screen um, for us. My happy face is in the, in the yes. screen there, okay. We're taking up the whole wall of the, the Japanese room. Now, <laughs> that was exactly what we hoped would happen, is you would thread together a whole series of interesting case studies. So I'm sure, so the students have all been given, um, there's about 30 different case studies, probably about 12 to 14 in Vienna. Mm -hmm. um, so Joseph Frank, um, with a couple of case studies um, there, out of loss variety of others but what's interesting as well is you talked about Kulka and mm -hmm. Kulka obviously arrived in, in New Zealand um, and we've got Kulka as a, as a case study as well mm -hmm. and I'm probably just to kick off the questions I'd be curious about I mean you, you just touched on the authorship of the round plan mm -hmm. uh, and Kulka's writing and I know that's, I'm curious about your research and, and where that's landed on, on the sense of authorship. Um, so in terms of your understanding of Kulka's relationship, I mean, he, it's 1927, I think he becomes a partner with Loss, but he's been working with Loss since, what, 1919, some Around 1919, 1920, it's unclear, but around sometime right after the First World War, he started working uh, with Loss, uh, for Loss. Um, he worked with him off and on until 1933. He actually completed the last of Los's houses, a uh, house that's in Pilsen, the, this uh, Semler house. Um, so he knew him very well. He knew him very well. He worked on many of the houses, though not all of them. He had Los relied on other assistants often when he was working in the Czech lands. Yeah. Um, and, but it's Kulka who writes the first monograph about uh, Loos. And the very interesting thing, if you follow the, the trail, the very interesting thing about Loos is that Loos writes very, very little about the Ramplan concept. Um, he mentions it once in a piece that he writes about his favorite cabinet maker. Um, it's a footnote. He talks about basically playing three-dimensional chess with architecture. He alludes to it a couple of other times, very, very much in passing. It's only Kulka in the section in the monograph uh, that was published in, uh, it's actually published in, in, in 1931, written in 1930 and 31, um, that he actually lays out the term and the concept. It's Kulka who describes, in fact, that Los came to the idea while sitting in a box in the theater and realizing that the box itself had an impossibly low ceiling, but it was made comfortable by the fact that one was looking out into a larger space. 
Uh, so we know those things. We know a few other things that, that Los talks about here and there uh, in his writings about how one moves through space. Um, but there's not a lot. One has to read most of it out of the buildings. And what's very interesting is that none of the figures that I talked about, not Frank, not Strunet, not Los, ever mentioned in their writings that they had read Schmazo, that they ever knew anything about the German debates about the perception of space in the 1890s, nothing like that. That but makes it difficult. That makes it difficult. I'm going to be quite selfish and ask another question before we open up. Um, and sorry, could I ask someone just the lights on? There's a button behind the corner. Christopher, one of the, um, just picking up in Frederick Keisler's work, he obviously, I mean, one of our case studies is the, um, the theatre, um, mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. endless, endless space, um, right. endless theatre. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that would appear to predate the endless house. Um, so all the work he's does. doing, yeah, all the work he's doing around theatre. Now, what you describe in a lot of these um, houses is quite theatrical. And I know that's been written about in the past in terms of Adolf Loss, um, the... Um, and we've also traced some, um, so there's a, one of our emigre architects, Ernest Fuchs, um, mm -hmm. who emerged out of Vienna. We found some evidence that he was, um, he left architecture school after two years and went to Hellerau Theatre on a family holiday. Mm -hmm. and was so influenced by it. In fact, Catherine Townsend, I think, who's actually on Zoom, has, mm -hmm. uh, has written about this. Um, so Fuchs goes to Hellero Theatre and is deeply impacted by that experience. He goes back and re-enrolls in architecture. But he also is involved in theatre more broadly. And some other emigres that arrived in Australia um, have got strong connections back into um, um, theatre and theatre studies. So I just, again, was curious about the impact of theatre, the impact of Vienna at that point in time and what's going on in the other, other kind of arts and creative practices and how much that might have influenced. What, I'm, and I'm not gonna steal Catherine's thunder, Catherine might ask the question about psychoanalysis as well, and Freud. Um, um, so I'm just curious about those two aspects that are going on in a Viennese context in the early 1900s and how they might be playing out in the world of architecture. Yeah, it's a great question. It's, it's, it is a question I talk about a bit in the new space. So there's a bit about theater. Uh, it's about the Dalcroix uh, dancers. It's about Hellerau and so forth. Vienna is very much a theater culture. So it's a, it's a culture that's very much framed around going to the theater, around going around to movies. So it's certainly something that they all would have thought about immediately. Um, but draw the exact connection is rather difficult yeah. because they don't tell us that. What we what we do know is that Strunet spent the last years of his life designing for the theater. Uh, Frank actually designed one movie set. Uh, Los designed theaters as well. But they never write about how their understanding of theater connects to their understanding of space uh, in this context, except for one piece from Strunner, which is translated in the in the New Space book. Um, it's very difficult. Um, the best lead I can give you, the, the most interesting lead I can give you is one you may already know, and that is that Schindler, R.M. Schindler, who comes out of this context, wrote very early, quite early, around 1911, it seems, an essay about space, where he too picks up on the possibilities of ineffable or expanding space. There's a terrifically good piece about that written very recently by Alex Ross. It's on, in, on an online site called um, Site, I think, site.org, um, put out by um, uh, Emory University. If you can't find the, the citation, please just contact me. But it's Alex Ross, who's actually the music critic for the uh, New Yorker in the United States. And Alex Ross wrote a very, very interesting piece on, uh, on this uh, extraordinary essay that Schindler wrote uh, about space. But your, your question is an extremely good one. And the answer is that I can't tell you exactly, even after having spent many, many years researching this, 
Uh, frustratingly, these are architects, they don't write a great deal. They, they, they all wrote, uh, Frank wrote, Lowe's wrote, Schlundedal wrote, but they didn't ever write in such a way that gives very many useful clues about what they were thinking about, what they had read, or why, how they were drawing from it. Um, Catherine asked a very good question that I'd like to answer. And her question is, I'm interested in why you think it was that the Austrian rather than the German architects were the ones who experimented most with the manipulation of corporeal experience in interiors. It's a wonderful question. I can't give you an answer. I don't know. Again, I don't know. What I do know, the one answer that I can give you is that everyone who experimented in this way, and that would be Stunded, Los, Frank, Schindler, um, Kulka, you didn't mention Plischke, but Plischke, of course, another very important figure in New Zealand. Uh, Plischke was a, Frank's assistant for a time. Um, they all knew each other. They were all in discussion with each other. They were all quite close. I think these were discussions that they had amongst themselves. I think that's where it comes from. I think it probably all comes from Stunet, who is the, the real intellectual of the group. And I think these were discussions that they had. Um, and why they all sort of followed the same or very similar ideas. Annoyingly, they wrote very little that helps us with that. Yeah, Plischke is one of our case studies as well. Uh, yeah. You might look, if you haven't, I don't know if it's on your list, but you might look at the house Gamerit, G-A-M-E-R-I-T-H in Austria. It's, a, it's on a lake in Austria. Really, really extraordinary building. It's one of the last ones that... Uh, that Plischke did uh, before he too emigrated. He emigrated, as you know, in 1939 and ended up in, I think he was in Wellington first. Is that right? Or is he in Christchurch? I've forgotten now. Well, he's one of the, the first house um, is in Christchurch, isn't it? Yeah. He yeah, wasn't, I think he was in Christchurch. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, sorry, uh, Christopher, could you repeat what the name of that house was? Gamerit, G A M E R I T H. It's also sometimes referred to as the house on Atazé, because that's where it is. It's on the Atazé in uh, uh, Upper Austria. Yeah, I know Philip's probably bonding <clears throat> with... Philip's probably got lots of questions. But... Look, I, I, Christopher, I had a... And thanks so much for the talk. It was just fantastic. I had a question. It was a similar one you've almost answered. It was about, um, was there a public dialogue between designers like Frank, Sternard and Lois? Mm -hmm. and uh, Plischke and others. And if that, it, it sounds like they didn't publish anything, but if there was a public dialogue, was it within offices or was there a place where architects met? How, how do you think they, they spoke about these ideas? So early on, we know that Frank and Stunert would meet Los in a place called Café Museum. It was the museum, the, the cafe that, um, that Los designed, the very famous one they designed in 1899, the so-called Café Nelismus. Mm -hmm. um, and they described being in there and talking to Lois and listening to his stories. We also have from Neutra later on that he recalls being there as well and listening to Lois speak. So they, Lois was older than all of them. Lois, of course, born in 1870. Um, so he was a bit older than Frank, who was born in 1885. Schlinder was born in 1879. And of course, um, Plischke and Kulka were a whole generation younger. They were both born around the turn of the century. Um, so he would have been the grand old man. Um, and I suspect that some of these discussions were public initially. Later on, uh, I think most of them occurred in private. I think Lois would talk to Kulka in the office. I think Frank would talk to Plischke. In fact, I know he talked to Plischke in the office. I, I, I was able to interview Plischke after he moved back to Vienna before he died. Uh, so I know he described you know, talking to Frank in the office. When, when, when Frank would show up at the office, he showed up very rarely. He didn't like to be in the architect's office. He would spend most of his day in the coffee house drawing his buildings on cocktail napkins and bringing them back to the office and sort of dropping them off for poor, poor Plischke to draw into actual usable drawings. Um, Stunert and Frank were very close friends. They probably talked in their living rooms. Um, you know, there's no record. We just, we don't know. We don't know beyond that how these discussions took place. All we can do is trace the lineage of the idea. We know that Stunert 
because of what he writes in the essays that I published in the news space. So Stroman writes a couple of essays right before World War I, and he uses language that's so similar to Shmosov that he had to have been reading it. It's just, it's almost impossible that he could not have been reading it and, came, and have come up with that language. Though he never mentions Shmosov by name. And we know that Frank and Loos, and then ultimately these younger architects were... Um, smitten would be the right word smitten with this idea about experience keesler is an interesting figure in this context because keesler doesn't he's not really part of the vini school in this period he's no one's student per se you know keesler was de facto mostly self-taught uh he doesn't really come on the scene until comparatively later keesler doesn't really appear on the vini scene until about nine later part of 1919 um and he's not really a well-known figure until he designs the, the theater piece uh, in 1924. Um, so he's a bit later where he heard about these ideas and how he was connected to them is a little unclear to me. If I had to guess, it was probably through Los. And do you, think, do, you think, do you think the educational institutions where they taught, they might have also spoken to students? The uh that's a complicated question the answer is before world war one no certainly not right. in fact um uh frank and Stunard were the students of a man named Karl koenig who was teaching at the technical university and koenig so despised los and los's pernicious impact on his students that he put up a notice one day telling the students that they couldn't talk to los <laughs> right. so they weren't getting it from koenig uh, they were getting it from Los, and all of you may realize or know that Los had a so called private building school, private Bauschule. Um, and uh, a number of well known architects were quote unquote his informal students, and that included Neutra, Schindler, um, Kulka. Um, I don't know about Plischke, uh, but there were, there were some others. Uh, who de facto studied with Los. They paid him tuition and he took them around and taught them things. Um, after World War I, Frank taught briefly, as did Strunet at the, uh, what was the, in those days called the Kunstgewerbeschule, the School of Arts and Crafts. Um, they were probably teaching something along those lines, though it's interesting. I interviewed some of the students from that period while they were still alive and nobody really reported that to me. Um, so I don't know, but for the most part, this was a discourse that was taking place outside of the academy, I believe. Any questions? Um, I had a very prosaic question about the Goldman and Salach uh, commission. Did mm -hmm. Los himself go and buy suits from them? That's that's a wonderful question. The answer is yes. So Los was something of a clothes horse. And when he came back from America in 1896, he actually stopped in London. He bought a suit or at least maybe a couple of suits on Savile Road that he couldn't afford. Um, and he went, when he got back to Vienna, he would have suits made by Goldman and Salich. The custom in those days for very expensive shops like Goldman and Salich was that they didn't bill you at the time. So you would go in and you would buy a suit and they would make it for you. And you would get a bill once a year on January 2nd. Well, well-to-do people would just pay off a very large bill because they'd be buying clothes throughout the year and they'd write you know, a, a check or send the money. Um, but of course, Lowe's found himself rather rapidly in debt to Goldman and Salich. So what he did actually was he went to Goldman and Salich after about a year and said, look, I, I, can't, I can't pay you. What I can do is I can redesign your, your tailor shop. And that's what he did. So he, that's how he designed the first Goldman Salich store, which was on the Graben on the main square in Vienna. He des designed that for them basically as a payback for the suits. And when they bought the property uh, where the buildings uh, stood, they, they purchased the, the property in 1909. Um, their initial plan was to hire a licensed architect to design the building because Los was not an artist, licensed architect. He'd never finished school. Uh, they had a competition and they asked Los to judge the drawings. And Los looked at all the drawings and said, they're, they're, they're terrible. None of these is adequate. And so the 
uh, Goldman, this was, by this time it was Goldman the son, not Goldman the father, his name was Leopold Goldman, asked the younger Goldman, uh, the younger Goldman asked Loos, well, can you design something better? And Loos did. Um, the problem was, of course, that he couldn't build the building because he couldn't sign the drawings. So they hired another architect, a man named Aufricht, uh, I'm sorry, a man named Epstein, Aufricht was the other partner, um, to, uh, to, to actually make the drawings official so they could be submitted. Uh, so that's how Los came to design the building. Um, his name, actually, if you go to the records, even to the, this day in Vienna, his name is nowhere on any of the drawings. It can't be. He was the chosen <laughs> architect. So, so he, he was never the, the architect of record for the building, which is fairly ironic, yeah. even though everyone knew he designed it. So, yes, he bought a lot of suits. The answer is he bought a lot of suits. He was a very natty dresser. There's a question on the back. Uh, it's a oddly specific question regarding the uh, relationship between Luce and the construction company uh, Katzer and Muller. Uh -huh. Due to um, Muller's extensive works in housing throughout Pilsen and their frequent collaboration with Luce, was there yep. any effort to rationalize the round plan in order to make it more accessible or feasible as a housing solution? Um, I also wonder if Luce and Kugler's Verfel House project um, has any connections with this effort since Caps and Muller were essentially the client who approached? Yeah, I didn't. Project. I didn't hear the second building you named. The uh, the, the the Verfel House. Say it again, or spell uh, it for me. Uh, w U R F E L H. Verfel, Verfel, yeah, Verfel. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um. So. Um. This, the story is rather complicated. Loos began working in Pilsen before World War I for a family named Hirsch. Um, all the families he worked for in Pilsen were Jewish and they all knew each other, uh, which is how he got the different commissions. So he basically, he would build a, uh, build something, actually build is the incorrect statement. He made interiors. These were in existing buildings for the most part with one or two very notable exceptions. And he would take existing interiors and redesign them um, for the clients. Uh, he did quite a number of them um, from uh, just before World War I, 1907, I think was the first one, if I recall correctly. And the last one was in 1933. Um, only two of those were purpose built. Um, and only one of the two purpose-built ones really shows strong emphasis, uh, strong evidence of the Ramplan. The Würfel House was a model that he built. Uh, it was done around, I'm trying to remember exactly, I think it's 1929 or 1930. I'd have to look exactly. Um, it's been a little bit since I wrote that book, frankly. Um, but it was around that time. It had uh, nothing to do actually with those clients, it had to do with Kops and Müller. Kops and Müller were a construction company, not Jewish, so not that usual constellation of the pills and clients. Uh, and Lowe's had come to know them through um, some other work he had done. Um, and through them, he began to work with one of their assistants, a man named Borjava Kriegerbeck. Uh, so Borjava Kriegerbeck uh, worked with him on some of those later projects, including the Würfel House, what sometimes is known, also known as the last house of Los, which was ostensibly designed for uh, Müller's daughter. He also worked for the Müller company's lawyer, a man named Vintenitz, that was the last of the big grand villas he designed. Um, but the it's it's a little bit of two different things, even though they were both in Pilsen, all of those interiors he did were for a spate of Jewish clients who all knew each other, and Kops and Müller was something actually slightly separate from that. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, probably one more follow-up. Is there any relationship between the Werfel House and uh, Heinrich Kumpel's uh, uh, Wiseman House? Probably yes. Probably yes. I mean, you know, it's, it's we don't really know exactly what Kulka was doing day for day in Losa's. Uh, they say Losa's office. He never really had an office, as you you would understand. There was no brick and mortar where you would go. He worked out of his apartment. He worked out of coffee houses. Basically, he would draw things and hand things to assistants, and they would do the work. Uh, and increasingly, after 1925, 1926, Los didn't draw. He simply would tell his assistants, he described to his assistants what he wanted. 
literally giving verbal instructions. So Kulka mostly worked from verbal instructions. You make the room this big, Los would imagine the buildings in his mind, make very, very tiny little drawings, usually again on a, a coffee house paper napkin, and hand them to them, and they would draw them out. And sometimes they had to draw them repeatedly because the verbal instructions weren't always that clear that you could actually come up with a workable rendering. That's what happened, for example, in the, in, with both the Müller house and the Vintenitz house. They had to be redrawn several times because the instructions that Los gave weren't clear. So the answer to the Würfel house is, I don't know. Uh, did he know that house? Probably yes. Um, did he work on it? I don't know. Um, did it inspire his work after that? Very likely, although it could have been any one of a number of Ramplon houses that he drew off of. The, the concept is pretty similar. And the very interesting thing about Los is if you look at those later houses, they're all a set of mannerisms. He has the same kind of basic ideas that he repeats over and over again in different, in different ways. Um, uh -huh. I, I thank you for your talk. It was super interesting. Um, I was just wondering. I've got sort of a two-part question, or mm -hmm. maybe sort of two questions as one. Um, I was wondering what, in your opinion, uh, the relationship between the work of these architects and psychoanalysis would be, and as sort of an extension of that, um, if there is a relationship. What, in your opinion, is that between this architecture and literary modernism of that time? Yeah, really, really interesting and good question. Um, there's something very interesting about Vienna, if you go there. And that is, it's very small. It's very, very small. In fact, even today, it's very small. It's a city of a little more than two million. And the main part of the city, the inner part of the city, which is the main, you know, 12 inner districts, you can walk across in 40 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. And even more to the point, all of these people in that great moment when Vienna is flowering at the turn of the century, they all knew each other. They all knew each other because they'd all gone to the same very few gymnasia. Most of them had come from the same backgrounds. Um... They went to the same coffee houses. They read the same books. So just to give you an example, Alban Berg, the composer, was a classmate of Josef Franks. And they were also, he was also a classmate with Hermann Bruch, the writer. So they were all in the same class together, the same class of you know 14 boys. Three of them became really, really noted modernists just out of that one class. Freud stood somewhat apart from those circles. His kids were well known to most of these people. So, you know, Fred had a bunch of children. The children were all pretty well known in that world. Uh, and I can give you an interesting example of that. At one point I was interviewing Frank's niece um, and the phone rang and she said, uh, oh, come down, I want you to meet somebody. And so little man comes down and, and, and I don't know who he is at first. It's a little, sort of little wizened man in his early 90s. And he walks in and holds out his hand and says, hello, I am Victor Frankl. And I realized, yeah, of course, you know, she knew Victor Frankl, logotherapy. And the two of them is sat on the couch putting away a pretty cons considerate amount of wine. And they were started talking about everybody that they knew in their childhood in the 1920s. And that included all the Freud children and included some of the older people like Adler that they knew, you know, they knew all those circles. Um, so there was a remarkable familiarity with all these people. The question, the really poignant question, the really important question is, is there intellectual overlap? And the answer is sometimes. So I can give you a very good example where there's a direct intellectual overlap. Neutra's brother, Richard Neutra's brother was a psychoanalyst in the Freud school. So Neutra was deeply influenced by his writings, his Freudian writings, and was very interested in the way in which psychology and architecture were paired. So there's a very direct relationship, and you can look it up and read about it, and it's very interesting. Frank, on the other hand, he had much closer relationship with um, the Vienna Circle. So his brother was a physicist. Philip Frank was a physicist. 
Philip Frank was actually the man who followed Einstein in the chair for theoretical physics in Prague when Einstein went to Berlin. He was one of the founders of the Vienna Circle, and through him, Frank knew all the other members of the Vienna Circle, including most notably Hans uh, Hahn, uh, because he used to, uh, he was closely befriended with Hahn's uh, uh, wife, who was blind, actually, very interestingly. So there, you know, there are connections, there are clear connections. The, the question is, can we relate for example, this notion of the, the round plan or this idea of experiential architecture to psychological ideas being born in Vienna in this period. And the answer is the same one I'll give you from before. Um, it's extremely difficult. They don't write it down. It's not in letters. Uh, rarely did I come across it exactly in interviews. People would just say to me, yeah, yeah, we knew all that. And that's that's kind of what they would tell me. So I'm, I'm old enough. I, I got to interview a lot of these people in the 70s and 80s when they were still alive, at least the ones that were still alive in the 70s and 80s. And they would all say the same thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, we knew all that, blah, 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 blah. But they'd never actually specify if it did anything for them, you know, if, if they had any sort of takeaway from it. So the, the the best answer I can give you is, well, sometimes it can be documented. Very often it cannot. I'm sorry that that's a rather frustrating answer, but that's as best I can give you. Christopher, I'm very conscious of time. Um, um, we're taking up you. Fine. It's, it's evening for me, and I've already had dinner, so I'm happy. However, <laughs> how long you want me, I will stay. So it's good. Look, well, look, there's one thing I'm curious about. We part of the interest in, in a lot of this stems from the fact that in the National Gallery of Victoria, so our major gallery mm -hmm. and the permanent collection is the Hoffman interior for the Gallia apartment yes they went to Sydney and then came to Melbourne and the Langer yeah. apartment from Adolf Loss that's right yep it's just fascinating that these two um and, and are we right in saying that Hoffman and Adolf Loss went to school together is that right no uh yes they did but school in a different sense so they were both in a school in their native town of well Loss's native town of Brno but no, now the second largest city in the Czech Republic. And they both went to a school called the Staatsgewerbe Schule. Uh, it was a, we would think of it as a vocational school. Uh, it was a vocational school that included things like machine building and so forth. And then they had a course for master builders. It wasn't an architecture course. It was a course for building. Hoffmann, who grew up near Brno on an estate, his father was an estate owner and manager. Um, grew up nearby and they both went to the, they were both in the same class of, I don't know, 12 or 14 boys. There weren't more than that. Um, so yes, they did go to school in that sense together. They were in that same class for, I'm trying to remember, I believe three years because Los came later. He'd gone to a different school before that. Yeah. So they knew, each other, they knew each other very, very well. They also hated each other pretty much lifelong. Yeah. Um, well, I suppose one of the things I was, um, the kind of thread of this was that it's, for us, it's fascinating. It's not just about people. It's about objects and, and, and artifacts and furniture and full interiors that, that migrate um, and move. And mm -hmm. we were talking last week about Klischka's apartment for Lucy Rye, the, the mm -hmm. synopsis in 1928 that goes to London. Yep. And, and, and Freud's son ends up redeveloping re it for the interior there and now it's back in Vienna. Yeah. So I'm curious if any other interiors made their way to the US um, that you're, you, you know of. Whole interiors? No, lots of bits and pieces and certainly lots of Viennese ended up, many of them in New York. Um, the, the, those who left as a result of the rise of the Nazis, many of them ended up in New York working. So Sabotka, for example, uh, and many others were working in New York. There was, of course, a fairly large contingent of Viennese in Southern California, among them Neutra, Schindler, later on Paul T. Frankel, uh, and others. Um, but they didn't bring, you know, it's interesting, unlike Australia, we didn't end up with whole pieces. We ended yeah. up with bits and pieces rather instead, you know, we didn't end up with whole interiors like the Gallia, which is, it's a bit of a fluke. I mean, that, that whole interior ended up in, in Australia. It's extraordinary and wonderful, but a bit of a fluke. Um, 
I'm not aware. I'd have to think for a moment, but I, I don't come immediately. Nothing comes immediately to mind of an entire interior that, that came to the U.S. in that period. Look, one other question. I, look, I thought it was really interesting the point you make about the color photography or the color interior, because we are constantly. I'm sure the students are staring at black and white, and it's quite it's quite shocking sometimes to see it in colour. Um, again, I've read about the Dutch distilled movement, um, mm -hmm. which emerges around about 1917 or so. And some of the, the emigres in particular talk about their relationship to that. Again, the, where do you see the origins of, of colour? And I suppose this is maybe a way of talking about the counterpoint to what's going on with Hoffman and others um, in the Viennese secession movement, um, because there's an, an abstraction going on in some respects. So there's there's a really interesting color story in Vienna, and it's definitely related with to the rise of of the Jugendstil. The first blush of the Jugendstil, as it appeared in Munich, for example, as it came over from France, was to use a color palette that was very similar to the color palette the French was were using, and that is primarily pastels. So when you look at the first blush of the Art Nouveau. Uh, in Central Europe, you see mostly a pastel color palette. Pa the color palette looks very similar to what you would see in, in Lyon or Paris or Brussels from that period. As the Art Nouveau works its way into Vienna and later on in, actually in Munich, but especially in Vienna, um, what happens is that they begin to question this color palette and they question whether pastels are the most immediate most primary way of thinking about color? And the answer for the Viennese is no. Pastels are not primary color because they're not primary colors. And with Hoffmann, Olbrich, all those early figures of the Jugendstil in Vienna, they become intensely interested in primary colors. Certainly black and white, but also primary red, primary blue, primary yellow, primary green. And if you look at the works of the Wiener Werkstätte, you'll notice that in fact, there are very few pastels. It's mostly really bold colors, primary colors. So why primary colors? It goes back to the notion that particularly Ulbricht was keen on, and that is a return to the beginnings, a return to the beginnings of architecture through classicism, through archaism, there's an intense interest in archaic forms around the turn of the century. And the idea of returning to primary colors is another way of getting back at the very first of something. In other words, you throw out the, the, the ballast of the past and come back to the very most pure things that are possible. So that's archaic forms in classical architecture and primary color. And what you see the Viennese using very, very largely until after World War I is primary colors. Very, very bold colors. Not a lot of pastels, interestingly. By the way, it's worth noting that Johannes Itten, who starts the Vorkurs at the Bauhaus, which very much emphasized primary colors, was in Vienna in this period. So that sensibility probably almost certainly also came that Bauhaus sensibility about color almost certainly probably also has its origins in Vienna. Primary form, primary color. I promise this is my last question. That's good. I'm having fun. Taking advantage of it. Um, I'm, I'm loving that room. I, I just, I really want to be in that room. It's so gorgeous. <laughs> Well, we can organise that. Um, yeah, yeah, that would be lovely. Okay, out for the um, for next year. Now, that would be lovely. I would love that. I'm sorry. So go ahead. Just go and go back to Ernest Fuchs. So Philip and I um, have written um, about um, the growing house um, competition, mm -hmm. which happened in Vienna in 1932. Mm -hmm. Obviously, emerged in Berlin in 1931, and this was a demonstration village. Um, so the book, the catalogue for that is in our collection here at the university. Mm -hmm. um, now, when you look at the other architects that were involved, um, um, it's quite considerable. But I also discovered that Frederick Keisler was designing what he, he referred to as a nucleus house mm -hmm. in 1926 before he, before he left and went to 
New York. I'm just wondering any of your research, if you've come across this, this notion of the growing house, I suppose I'm, I'm curious about that in relation to the idea of the endless interior. Yeah, uh, I can answer that question a little bit, but I, there's someone you should put on your speaker series who's actually closer to you geographically than I am. Uh, one of my former students, her name is Laura McGuire, uh, who's at the University of Hawaii. So much closer to your time zone than I am. Yeah, Laura's uh, written about Keisler, yeah. Yeah, yeah, she wrote her dissertation and she's written extensively about the Nucleus House and other things. She would be a really good speaker for you and to answer that question. She knows it quite well. I, I don't want to take that away. I don't, I'm not sure I would get it exactly right. Yeah. Um, she spent years and years and years looking at these issues, so she's the one to talk to about that. Mm -hmm. But I would tell you that you're on the right path. You're absolutely correct that it's absolutely related to all these things that we're talking about. Great. Yeah. Uh, and Laura's a good egg, and you you will enjoy her. So if you can get her on there. She, she, I have she actually written to Laura. I have actually written to her to see if she can, she can give us okay. a Okay. You're yeah. actually, I think she, she, she's only six hours from you, so, you know, in time, in time zones. <laughs> Much easier. Well, look, Christopher, this has been um, fantastic. We could probably have gone on for hours asking questions, but um, it's been a delight talking to you. What we'll do is we'll probably share the the work um, of the students because it is a bit of a this this subject's always a bit of a discovery for us. We're always finding new leads and threads, and I think you've really helped us today to piece together some some clues that we've had for a long time. Yeah. If you get stuck or any of the students have questions, you have my email address, you know where to find me, please please avail yourselves yep. and I will tell you what I know. Um, I've done this for a long time and an awful lot of what I know I never, I've never published. So uh, please, yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to help. It's a really interesting discussion that you're having there. Um, and I applaud you actually for, for following down this road because I think it has tremendous relevance for the architectural discourse of today. I really do. I think this notion of how architecture be, can become fully experiential is a really interesting one for us now. Oh, look, I really appreciate it. Look, please join me in our um, thanks for Christopher for... Yeah. Um, and I, I look, Catherine obviously asked a question. Catherine is online, teaches into the subject as well as doing a PhD in this area. So Catherine might be in touch with you, I'm sure. I'm sure, yeah, sure. Some, I, yeah. I, I've read some of her things. So yeah, I, I'm, familiar, I'm not familiar with her, but I, I know her work. So Fantastic. yeah, we, we, we live in a relatively small world now. So. <laughs> All righty. Well, look, thank you. Enjoy your evening. We'll be in touch. Okay. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks so much. And this was a pleasure. Uh, uh, hopefully at some point I get to see you guys face to face. That would be lovely. All right. Thank Ciao, you. Thank you.